great. Uh, well, thank you everyone for, on Twitch and on Zoom for coming to SF Haskell. Um, hopefully in 2023, we're going to have in-person events as well as online events. If anyone wants to do a talk at our meetup in person or virtual, please let me know. Great. Well, without further ado, um, the, let me hand over everything over to Ryan Orendorf, who's going to do a talk on You Got Agda in my Haskell. Over to you, Ryan. Thanks. Um, yeah, so my talk today is titled You Got Agda in my Haskell. It's about a tool that recently came out called Agda to HS, uh, which was first presented in a paper, I think, in September last year. And then there's a blog post about it. It's been around for about two years, but I think like their first like real launch was uh, recently. Um, so what is this tool? Agda to HS is a tool that allows you to transpile Agda code and convert it into Haskell code that looks like as if it was written by a person. Now, the way that Agda works, there actually is some backend compilers that allow you to compile to other things. So you can compile to Haskell uh, with some of the built-in tooling and I believe also JavaScript. Uh, but the code that is produced kind of looks really hairy. It doesn't look like code that you would actually write yourself. Um, kind of maybe like if you were to compile to something like Wasm or something like that, where you get kind of like, that's not JavaScript you would write yourself. Um, so this tool actually produces code that looks like as if you wrote it somewhat by hand. Um, so much of the this talk is based on ideas and like kind of blog posts from uh, Jesper Cox, who's the guy who primary primary writer, as far as I understand, of this library, um, and so that he has a blog post, which is the first link, a or sorry, second link. Uh, the paper is the first link, and then you can find the repository for the actual uh, utility at that GitHub link. So in this talk, we'll be talking about a few different things. Um, the first thing we'll be talking about is extrinsic validation, which is validating or proving properties about code that you already have written. The next topic will be about intrinsic validation, which is where you have code that actually includes properties that you want to be valid about that code carried along with it. So then that's kind of where more some of the dependent types components of Agda comes in. Uh, then we'll talk about how you might obey the law. I'll leave that a little bit ambiguous at the moment. And then some final comments. Uh, so let's start off with extrinsic verification. So the kind of canonical higher order function that you would use in any functional programming language is probably map. So uh, when you map um, some function over a container, say a list, what you do is that you take each element in that list or in that container, and then you apply F to it and then recollect it. So here, when it's written out, this is just Agda code. And you'll notice that it looks very similar to Haskell code. For the kind of base case, what we have is um, you map over an empty list, but since there's nothing to do, you just return the empty list. In the inductive case, what you do is you break apart the head of the list and the rest of the list. You apply the function to the head of the list, and then you recursively apply your map function to the rest of the list that, um, in order to apply it to every element. Now, th there is just some random subtle differences here that I'll point out, because there is a mix of Agda code and Haskell code in this talk. And so basically, whenever you see a type where the type is denoted by just a single colon, that's probably something from Agda, um, or it is something from Agda. The other thing is that Agda, and I'll point these out, there's a few things that come up, but I'll point them out as we go along. Agda has these curly braces, and that's an implicit argument. So normally, say, if you're in Haskell and you were just to write this function, you would just say A to B, and then list of A to list of B. So there's kind of an implicit assumption there that there is some type uh, so there's some type variable A and some type variable B. And in Agda, you can't just, it doesn't try to magically find those for you. You actually have to provide them. But in a lot of cases, it can try to figure out, oh, actually, I'm missing a B here as part of the set. Um, so the um, you have to provide it as part of the input. Um, and the reason actually why this is okay is because I've defined B elsewhere in the file. This is actually a compiled file. Um, so sorry about that. Um, and then the kind of magic sauce here that Agda to HS provides is that you provide this compiler pragma. So basically what you can do is you can take your map function, which is written in this nice Agda style, and convert it into Haskell code by just writing compile Agda to HS and the map function. So I'm calling it the peanut butter and chocolate collider. Um, the whole premise of this talk is if you've seen an old school or even more recent Reese's uh, commercial, there's always like some guy who's holding or some person who's holding a chocolate bar and someone who's holding a jar of peanut butter. They smash in together and then they argue with each other or they don't argue. They're like, you got chocolate in my peanut butter. So this is, you got agged in my Haskell. So when you run this uh, tool on the result, what you end up getting is that you get the map function that you expect. Um, and so you can, here you can see like it looks a little bit more like Haskell code that you would expect. There's the double colon for the type. Um, and then all of the type parameters are now uh, inferred. 
So one thing that we might want to do in order to make sure that we've actually implemented the map function correctly is we might want to show that the map preserves the length of the list. It's probably one of the more canonical properties that you would have of map to try to show. Um, so this is just to say that like for any um, anytime you map over any container, you shouldn't drop anything. You shouldn't either add any elements or lose any elements, right? So one way that uh, you could do this in Haskell is you could write what do what's called property-based testing. So property-based testing is where you have some sort of property that you'd like to test. In this case, you want to test that the length of applying the map to some list is the same as the length of that list um, where you haven't done anything to it. And here I've just provided some random function. And then property-based testing allows you, well, is a, pro is a tool that basically generates lists for you or whatever sort of data type you need as an input and tries a bunch of them on your input. And then if there's any case that fails, it tries to find the most simple example for you to fail. So property-based testing is great because you're allowed to kind of state these properties about your code. But one thing it doesn't do is that it's, it is a uh, random tester. So it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't prove that your input works for every case. Uh, there could be some, in, in the map, it'd be hard to figure out exactly what that would be, but there may be some pathological case where you have an extremely large number of elements, or potentially if you've implemented some sort of weird corner case in your map uh, that it just doesn't sample while well, it's trying to do its random testing of inputs, you'll miss it. So property testing is great, but it's not quite complete. Um, but we, what we'd like to be able to show is that we can our map function actually preserves the length of the list for every input. It doesn't matter what the list is um, or what it contains. So recall that our function, when it, it was an Agda, is defined by this. Um, and I guess also I should have mentioned this that the slightly closer together, this is the unfortunate part between Agda and Haskell, the slightly closer together pair of colons is the cons operator. If they're slightly farther apart, it's the Haskell type operator. <laughs> so anyway, um, the what we want to be able to do is that we want to be able to prove that the length of the list um, is preserved. So here uh, is just the statement of kind of what our proof is going to be. So given some A and some B and a function that goes from A to B and a list of some type A, then we want to show that if we map the uh, over that list and take the length, it's the same as just taking the length. Now, here there's a triple bar equals, which is, just says that it's the Agda way to say that things are equivalent as um, in structure, in a sense. So this is actually a proof that says that these two things are the same. These statements are equivalent. Um, so usually when you do this, kind of like everything in functional programming, um, there's a inductive and or it's recursive slash it's an inductive based process so the first kind of way to do this proof is that you say that for the empty list what happens so if you put in the empty list what happens is that agda is actually pretty good about telling you it's uh about reducing the forms that it can see so essentially what here will do is like okay it will know that it has the empty list it will apply the empty list to map and it will know that from the cases that it has for the definition of map that if it applies an empty list that it should get the empty list so what it wants to show at the end when it kind of reduces down and if you ask agda like what do i need to prove it will say that you need to prove that the length of an empty list is equal to the length of an empty list um and also conveniently that the length of the empty list when you define that is also zero. So really what you need to do is prove zero equals zero. Um, and you can do that by a term called reflexivity, which is often abbreviated as REFL. So REFL just says that these two are the exact same thing. Like they look the same, they are the same. So when we want to do the inductive case, what are we going to do? So we're going to break this down into pieces, but we're going to kind of start off by breaking the list into the head, which we're going to call X and the rest of the list XS. And then this begin part means that we're going to kind of start a way of doing a proof that likes looks kind of like how we would do it in a on a chalkboard. So what we want to eventually show is that the length of f applied to x cons the recursive map of f onto xs is going to be the same as the length of just uh, x cons onto xs. But we need to transform the equation in order to get there. So the first step uh, is that we're just going to, uh, actually I should have done this a little different, but the, we have these empty brackets um, and these empty brackets basically say that this, the Agda compiler can figure out that this step is true. Uh, this first step that we go from length to the successor of the length, successor is just means plus one. So this allows us to say that these two equations are the same. And now what we need to do is basically what we want to show is that we want to get rid of the map and just go back to the excess part, right? We want to, uh, on the, Eventual side, the right-hand side of this proof, we want to show that we're just dealing with the length of the normal list. 
So here we can use the inductive hypothesis. So essentially this Kong suck part just says that like, I want to apply some proof or some transformation underneath the suck uh, function. So here it's saying, I want to apply some sort of transformation onto this piece that I've highlighted, which hopefully it shows up. Um, and the, what I want to apply is the map length proof that I had from the prior iteration or from the inductive hypothesis. This allows us to then convert that into just the successor of the length of XS. And then we get our proof that uh, we get from the length of F of X cons map F, F uh, map F of X of S that we really is the same thing as the length of just the original list. So this is great. We've proved a property about our program. Um, and what we've done here is that we've proven it extrinsically. So this code already existed. It doesn't have any kind of like dependent types or anything like that in it. It's just some normal code that you could have written in Haskell and we've proven a property about it. So that's a pretty powerful thing is that you can take existing, um, without modifications, you can take existing code you might have to convert it into Agda syntax. And they eventually, I think they want to make a tool that helps make that easier, but you could convert Haskell code into Agda syntax and then do some properties and proofs about it. Um, and then just use the Agda one from then on. So one convenient thing about this library and what's been implemented is that you can also do type classes. So, um, so say you want to, in Agda, they're not called type classes, they're called instance arguments. But say you want to have a minimum function, which says that if I have two arguments, I want to take the minimum of them. So it's just defined as if for the minimum of X and Y is if X is less than Y, then I return X. Otherwise, I return Y, right? Um, and this is in the ordered type class. Now, the ordered type class or instance argument here has this curly braces. You'll notice that Agda has a lot of Unicode, um, which is fun. Uh, it makes it actually quite concise to write, which is nice, or to read, I should say. Um, but the um, this essentially, you can think of it as like having a type class constraint. It's a little different, but in this case, this is how it's being used. If we run it through our tool, we get the following Haskell code as an output. So you can see min is now takes uh, as a constraint that it's part of the ordered type class. A is part of the ordered type class. And we get the output that we would expect. Now, here's another piece of code that we'll want to kind of do an extrinsic property on. What we want to prove, say, in this case, is that our minimum min function is commutative, which is to say that if you had the minimum of x and y, it's the same as the minimum of y and x. That it doesn't matter if you switch the input arguments, you should get the same thing. Um, and here as a reference is, because we'll just refer to it, is the definition of minimum. So in order to do this, we'll need to uh, postulate a property about uh, ordered type classes. So in one... In this particular case, there is no proof provided in the type class, although we'll get to that a little bit, about what it means to be ordered. And really, the ordered type class in Haskell really just says that you have some functions. There's a set of functions, but the primary one is that you can compare them. Um, and so you can think of this as like that the comparison re results in an ordering. It doesn't necessarily say that you've done the name implies the order. there should be an order to the elements in whatever type A you have, but it doesn't actually enforce that. You could uh, have some sort of generator that takes two elements and does a comparison and produces something that is not at all ordered, but does gives you an answer for every input. So it wouldn't be ordered, um, but it would still be in that type class. Here, I'm saying that like, I'm gonna assume that members who have implemented the ordered type class are behaving properly and therefore I should be able to state this property. So this flip property here essentially says that if I have uh, X is less than Y is equal to some Boolean, that if I flip the input arguments there, that I should get the other Boolean. So if I say X is less than Y is equal to true, then if I flip them so and say Y is less than X, I should get false. So here I've just stated it and I haven't proved it because I can't, um, at least in this current setup. And then what we can do is we can do a proof of our minimization function actually does commute. So what this says is that essentially what we do is a case split. So what we do is we say we have our X and Y and then this with uh, x is less than y equal in q is just to say that we uh, pattern match on x is less than y and we keep around the name or like what it is as the name eq. Um, so in the case where it's false, what we can do is that essentially Agda will put in as much as it can. So for this definition, um, actually, yeah, okay, the false case is also easy. So what it can do here is that it will say like, it knows this is false. So up here at the part where it says, if F is less than Y in the definition, it will input false. And then it will still, now that it knows that the, the predicate or the input to the if statement is false, it will just return to you Y. So 
that part's easy. So then essentially what this proof will ask for is that y is equal to y is uh, less than x. And then with the arguments flipped where it's like, then y else x. And so that part, it doesn't know how to do. And that's what this rewrite does. This rewrite basically says, it's like, okay, I actually know that if I flip those arguments that the to the uh, inequality there, that I actually get the opposite Boolean, which means I'm able to reduce the if statement again. So that's kind of cool. You can now take something that has a type class as well and prove properties about that. So extrinsic validation is kind of proofs about what I'm going to call regular code, which maybe is a bit of a misnomer, but we've seen about two ways to do this. Uh, so you can prove some properties on higher order functions or really kind of any function you have. I've just chosen one that didn't have a specific type to it. Like it was abstracted over a type A called map length. Um, and then you can also have a property, um, proof properties about functions that involve type classes, which was our minimum commute function. But we can do more uh, when we can encode properties in our types. So then that kind of gets to the next part, intrinsic verification. So what is intrinsic verification? Well, in order to get there, I'm going to go through a slight detour, one slide on what dependent types are. Um, so bear with me. But the um, so a non-dependent, a way to think of a dependent types is really to think about dependent functions. Um, and with dependent functions, um, essentially, or non-dependent functions, what you have is you'd have some function that takes some element of type A and returns some element of type B. Um, so it doesn't really matter what that element of type A is, it will return something of B. And there's no way necessarily to say that there's a specific A that will return a specific, or uh, that will change what happens to the type of B. So in a dependent case, what you do instead is that you prove, or sorry, not proof, you have a function that goes from some type A, but now you have the value of that type, which we'll call X. And the output type is now dependent on the value X, like whatever that X is, um, and inside this family of types called B. So maybe a good way to describe this, and we'll get to kind of the canonical example next, but say you have this function called optimal int, and what you want to do is you want to take some natural number that you have, and you want to convert it into an integer, but you want to use what's available within machine precision before going to the unlimited size big int integer. So here, this first function optimal int basically just says this type says that for some uh, input x of type natural, we're going to return an ag that's not called type, it's called set. Um, so we're going to return some type. And it's basically what we're going to do is if x is greater than, we're going to say 64-bit precision on an integer, then, well, unsigned. So I guess we're going to assume these are unsigned. I've just made up this example as pseudocode. Uh, then we're going to use the int type class. Otherwise, we're going to use the integer type class. Um, oh, I flipped this around, actually. Um, so nat to int basically then allows you to um, take some x of type nat and then convert it into the optimal form. Um, had I actually flipped those inputs correctly. Um, this is very Ryan, little. Uh, did you want to take questions at the end of your talk or during it? Because we have question. Oh, we have a question in the Twitch chat. I just wanted to mention. Uh, Sorry yeah. to interrupt. I can take questions now. Okay, great. Uh, there, um, uh, there, there, there's one question uh, uh, that says, are these agdalists defined inductively or co-inductively? And are they mapped to an inductive or a co-inductive co version on the Haskell side? It seems like if it goes from inductive to co-inductive, you could be proving nonsensical things, e.g. proving agda that all your lists have finite length. But this is not preserved by translation. Yeah, this was so, asked about five minutes ago, so um, I didn't want to interrupt your call. This is ah. flow earlier, so it, it, it's probably relevant to an earlier slide. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good question. So essentially, there uh, there is a mapping between. So maybe a good example is that um, if you have a list, um, then. Uh, so you can map that to so the list is inductively defined in Haskell as well, but there's another type that's not inductively defined that's co-inductively defined called stream. So stream represents infinite values. So Agda doesn't necessarily really like to deal with infinite values super easily, but there is a way to do it through co-inductive types that where you can basically have define stream, assuming that you define stream where there's kind of like this part that you compute later that involves then thunks and these kinds of other components. So you could basically prove properties about lists and you could prove properties about streams, but Agda to HS is never going to convert an, a list into a stream or a stream into a list or anything like that. So it's not going to convert across, but the concepts exist on both sides of the barrier. So you can take um, like the property that we proved for uh, 
lists that were like mapping of lists should work for all lists. If it's an infinitely sized list, like if you had one that just kept going, then one could argue that your property doesn't truly hold because then your property is like, well, your, your computer will never actually terminate the computation. And then really what you get is the result is bottom, the bottom type. But outside of those cases, um, I think generally you're dealing with proofs that will likely make sense. Okay. Um, yeah. So the uh, dependent types and yeah, sorry, this flip is the wrong way. It should be less than, but anyway, it allows you to basically say that I have some output type that I'm going to choose or some output that is dependent on the input. So the canonical example here is a vector. So a vector, uh, when you write it as dependent types, is a list that carries its length in the type. So here we have a vector uh, over a set A so or a type A. And also you'll see here that there's this other part here that's an N and it's a natural number. That keeps track of the actual length of the list. So in order to construct a length of a list, you always have to um, have some sort of size related to it. So here the easiest case to see here is nil. So when you have an empty list, what you are constructing is a, a vector of, si of type A that is of size zero. And so that's what you see zero directly in the type here. And then cons um, does exactly what you would do with cons for lists, except for it also then keeps track of the length of the list. And then you'll see here that normally when you cons, the second element of cons is uh, some list, and then you return a new list. Here, the list you return has to be size one larger. So um, that's kind of cool. You can basically show here that like you're never, if you're going to cons onto something, you're always going to get something bigger. Um, note here that, so again, those kind of curly braces come up, which those just mean that this argument can be inferred usually by Agda, or you're, you're trying to get Agda to usually infer it for you. Um, the at zero is a more interesting one. It's a little bit newer, but basically what it says is that this property is not used at runtime, which is kind of a funny thing because Agda is not really used at runtime in the first place. But what it says is that like, if you were to compile this code and try to run it, that it's actually never, you never use this property in the code itself. You don't necessarily like try to pattern match on it. You don't look for it. You don't, you're just storing it. So if you're just storing it, and at least in the compiler sense, um, you can actually just drop it if you're not actually going to use it for anything. So the at zero means that the value is erased at runtime. Um, and when you compile this, it compiles down actually just to the list that you expect. So here is the data. Uh, it's basically just list, but with the name vec, right? So your base case is nil, and then otherwise it's cons of some element and then another vector. So unlike extrinsic validation, intrinsic properties allow us to kind of enforce, uh, have our code be correct by construction, meaning we can't actually produce the wrong thing even in the first case. So say I wanted to write the map function that we had before and say I wanted to, say I did a I didn't do it correctly, where I accidentally forgot to actually append or prepend the applied f applied to the new element that I was looking at. So here, um, the type here says that I'm going to take a function from A to B and take a vector of size n and return a vector of size n. And then the problem I made here is I did, I forgot to actually use x. I didn't do anything with it. And in fact, I dropped it completely. So if I ran this function, I would actually just expect the empty list all the time, which means that I wouldn't actually get a vector of size n. I get always a vector of size zero. But so in Haskell, you could do this and it would just be like, OK, sure, whatever, um, which makes sense. It's not part of the type. Um, but in Agda, Agda will actually tell you, it'll be like, hey, uh, so you promised me at the end of this that you would return something that was the right size. And it will say that actually I, I'm not getting that answer. I'm what I'm. I should get from like some size uh, and I should get N plus one where I'm inductively building it up, but I'm not actually getting that. Um, and so that's quite nice that Agda will now tell you specifically when, even when you're trying to write this type of function that you violated some sort of property that you're holding inside the type itself. This also means that we don't need to write the map length proof that we did before because it's implicit in the actual definition of vector itself and the type definition at the top level of map. We can't implement a map function that is a type vector a to n to vector b of n uh, in any way that drops and that produces a different sized element. We could potentially do things where we like take two and drop one, take two, drop the next one, that kind of thing. Um, so there's other properties you might want to verify, but at least the length is the same. Um, so that's kind of an easy proof. Uh, and maybe a more difficult one that we might want to go through is interleaving. So for interleaving, uh, essentially you're just taking an element from 
uh, you have two vectors and you want to take the first element of the first vector, then the first element of the second vector, then the second element of the first vector, then the second element of the second vector and interleave them that way. So the definition for interleave uh, is pretty simple. So this is if you have a case where this is actually a um, if you have a case where the input list is empty, then you just return the resulting list. If you have a case where you have a cons on the first element, then you're going to take that first element, but then you're going to call interleave where you flip the arguments. So Agda will complain about this code because basically what the problem is, is that when it tries to, um, so the resulting type here is vector of n plus m, whatever the size of the two vectors are. Um, and what it will complain about is that it doesn't actually know, like you've written something that seems reasonable, but it doesn't actually know that m plus n is equal to n plus m. Um, which is quite a mouthful, uh, but the, so essentially what we need to do is in order for it to, Agda is maybe a bit picky in this sense, but it's saying that like, it really wants you to show that you've done this correctly and that you've done this proof, uh, that you've implemented this properly, which is not something you would have if you were trying to write this in Haskell. So what we need for this is we need a proof that addition is commutative, but we're gonna need that it is erased because we actually can't, we don't want it at runtime. So here we have, um, that at zero kind of starts appearing everywhere. Um, you can see at zero can also be used at the start of the name of a function. So that basically allows you to say that this function will also produce a proof here in this case that we also can't uh, use at runtime. So here, uh, what we're saying is that we wanna prove that M plus N is the same as N plus M. And then the proof is like pretty simple. It's kind of what you would expect. Um, it, this is just saying this first line for the inductive case, which is where M is zero. It's just saying that zero plus N is, is the same as N plus zero. And then the inductive case just says that if I, well, that's a weird highlight. Mm -hmm. oh, the, uh, it's just saying that if I have like uh, the N plus one case that it still works out that I can flip things around and it doesn't matter. Um, so notice that also like, and I want to stress that this is a, a property that's an erased property so that we've produced a property that uh, we don't actually, we can store only in places that we know we're not actually going to store at runtime. Um, there are cases in Agda. So this has came up when actually when I was trying to write parts of this talk that where I wanted to do something and specifically I want to do brawn trees, but which is a type of balanced tree, which includes in its type kind of the length, the size of the tree, but it includes as one of the parts of the constructor of proof that either the left subtree and the right subtree are the same size, or one of them is slightly was bigger by one. Um, but unfortunately, if I include that, one of the things you need to do in order, or at least write the insert function you would most normally think of, at least in the intrinsic case, is you would want to pattern match on that proof and say, which one is it? Is do I have this two subtrees are the same size or are the two subtrees different by one? Um, so you can't use that. That would not be an erased property because at runtime, well, because again, in Agda, you're not really running, but at what would have been runtime, you would basically be interrogating that proof and saying like, which one did I actually have? Um, so how do we use this proof? So basically what we do in order to use this proof is we're going to use this function called transport. Sometimes it's also called substitution uh, or subst uh, is the most common one. Uh, and again, tons of at zeros. Uh, so essentially what it says is start for some predicate where we take some value A and or some type A and then return a new type in some set uh, that we, I'm going to say value here just because we're going to use it as a value. Um, and some uh, properties that we have some M and M such that M and N are the same. They don't have to be numbers. They're just some type A that are the same. That if we apply our predicate to M, we should be able to produce a predicate, predicate of N. Um, so really what, and I'll show you in a sec exactly what the definite use case for this is. Um, but what's kind of interesting here is that you notice that most of these at zeros here, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so I'm not using anything. And really what the end, what you have is that you have some function from P of M to P of N, where in the definition, you're taking that, that whatever that is and just returning the same thing. So if you compile this down, what transport will be, will be transport, will, you'll get transport of T is equal to T, which is to say that it's not an identity function. It's not actually doing anything. For us, it's useful because we're gonna be using it to basically show that some proof carries on to some other type. And we're trying to unify some types that otherwise Agda doesn't necessarily think can be unified. Um, but, the uh, Agda to HS allows us to kind of basically say that, okay, even though we need to use this in order in Agda, we can actually compile it away so that when you compile the has when you compile down to Haskell code, you won't see the function transport. Um, and that's what this transparent word does. So the concrete case here is commutative vector. So here, what we're gonna wanna show is that um, 
a if I have uh, as input a vector of a vector of type A of m plus m, and then it's the same as a vector of A of n plus m. So to use that with transport, what I'm transporting over that property, that predicate is um, vector of A. And then I'm either applying it to n plus m or n plus m. Um, and the way that I'm allowed to do that, the way that I'm allowed to basically go from one to the other is that I provide this proof that m and n um, are the same. Or m plus n is the same. And there's too many m's and n's in here. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then again, this is also has to be transparent because we don't actually want to use this proof at runtime. So now we can finish our interleave function. We have the same as before, but now when we have our interleave function, the cons part requires that we have the right type. And so here we're using transport through our convec property that basically allows us to say that we're applying interleave, but we've, we're showing Agda that we know that addition commutes or we can prove that addition commutes. And therefore you can actually, that this is valid code. And you'll notice that when you actually run Agda to HS on this, you'll get kind of what you expect. You get, uh, basically everything with all the proof carrying code components just alleviated. There is no, the vector does not have a size in it. The um, interleave component does not have that convec property that we've proven or have. Um, so you get kind of just plain Haskell code. You wouldn't have known that someone had maybe written this in Agda and then compiled it down into Haskell. So intrinsic properties verify that we can't be wrong in the first place, such that when we write code, we can kind of be sure that we're correct by construction. And this can lead to less proof code um, and sometimes easier cases. There's kind of like some people prefer to do more intrinsic properties and some people prefer to do more extrinsic verification kind of depends there. Uh, they work together. Um, they can be used together. And there's a lot of times where you'll have in things with intrinsic properties that you still have extrinsic properties you prove about it. Um, but essentially they're kind of like different spots in the design space. So you can kind of think of like what exactly you want to um, include or how you want to tackle your problem. Um, but then there's kind of, what else can we do? Uh, can we convert from Agda code into Haskell code? So this is the obey the law part. So we want type classes that obey the laws. So the most famous Haskell uh, type class, I think by far, and I mean, it's in the logo <laughs> in some senses, but is the monad type class. So, um, and this is not going to be a tutorial on monads, but essentially monads are applicative. So that's what, this is Agda syntax. So what it's read says is that a monad is at least an applicative. It has all the properties of the type class applicative. Plus it has this bind operator, which is written as the uh, two arrow equal sign, which is the kind of canonical one. If you have an M of A and an A to B, M of B, then I could produce an M of B uh, in that monad. And then this is just a, because we use for monads, we use return and for applicatives, we use pure. This is just a kind of alias here that says that we can use either of them. Now, uh, what's kind of interesting about this, so this type class is now encoded as an instance argument in Agda. Uh, when you compile this, you don't want to compile the existing monad type class. Monad exists like elsewhere, um, and you probably want to use the standard definition such that everything actually matches the um, imports everywhere else. So you can use this existing class. What you're saying is that I've redefined monad inside Agda such that I can use it for other properties, but it already exists in Haskell, so I can use it. So then when you try to compile this, it won't actually like produce this type class for you. Um, but there are some laws for monads that ideally we should hold, or if you want to reason about your code, should hold. So there's the left identity, which just says that if I take some element, promote it to the monad. So if I take some X, return X, converts it into the monad of type M of A. And then I apply my function F, which will be a um, A to M of B. It's the same as if I just take that function and just apply it to X, go directly from that A to M of B. There's a right identity, um, which is kind of similar, which is just saying that if I have a, a uh, an M of A, and then I do as my uh, second function, my transformation just return, which is where I'm doing nothing to it. I'm just wrapping it in the monad again. It should be the same as if I did nothing to it. And there is also an associative associativity operator, which says that there basically is a way from like, either I can do binds on the left-hand side, which this bind is saying I could do bind of K and F and then bind with G, or there's an equivalent operation where I bind on the right. So here I bind um, F and G with a Lambda kind of extraction around it. And then I bind K and that result of that. So for a monad to be like uh, a monad that acts in the way that you expect and to like, um, that uh, 
keeps on with all the properties that you kind of expect your code to have and doesn't violate any, you don't get any weird results when you run map M or anything like that. It should have some of these properties. Um, so one might ask, uh, uh, what stops a nefarious programmer from implementing the monad functions in a way that breaks the laws? So I came across uh, this kind of funny quote from Edward Komet, and he said, there are plenty of illegal monads out there. The monad police don't come to ar and arrest you. You just lose the ability to reason about them sanely in your code. Um, and I guess part of the kind of cool thing about this tool is, what if we could call the monad police? Like, what if they did exist? So. I found this on, this is kind of funny. You can generate a badge. You can actually like get a badge sent to you um, for 150 bucks that has anything you want on it. So this is from this website. Mm -hmm. So we could be the Monad police. We could be in the director of type class services. Maybe search and rescue is the thing I chose in the center because Agda is trying to find you and help you. Um, so we can be the Monad police when we're in Agda. So how do we do that? So essentially what we do in Agda is that we have now this lawful monad type class uh and it's a it will have all the same properties as a monad or all the same functions that's what this super part means or this overlap i should say but also we're going to have some of these properties which i've said that we're going to ignore at runtime which is that the left id and the right id and the associativity property are all upheld by this monad so um, in order to appease any monad inspector that you might come across with an official badge you're going to need to be able to basically show that these properties are being upheld so say maybe we take our maybe type and our maybe type is going to ask from our monad inspector is going to ask, hey, like, can I have a sort certif of certification that I'm proper? The monad inspector is going to say, well, can you prove these properties? And maybe we'll come back and say, absolutely. So what it will come back and say is that for the left identity, I have a proof that that is true. And it turns out, of course, all of these proofs are quite simple because of the way that Agda will then reduce all their code. It says that if for the left identity, turns out that it's just by if I just apply the definitions, I could just I just get the same result. But the right identity, if I break the type down into either nothing or just, then also the equations just work out. So I can just use reflexivity. And the same thing happens for associativity. If I break down my um, input into nothing or just x, that I can just use reflexivity again. So this is great. So now you have a, a type. Oh, so you have a maybe is both a monad, and now we can show that it is a lawful monad. Um, so now you can do things where instead of having before, and this is kind of, I just took the map M function, just why not, um, written in Agda. Uh, now, instead of having a monad as a constraint, we can say that we have a lawful monad as a constraint. So now we can say that we can only actually run this function on types that we have shown actually implement monad, the monad type class and do so properly. Um, so that's kind of a fun property. You can actually now finally say that you're not just like kind of add a comment being like, hey, like these actually apply the monad properties correctly. Be like, ah, yes, I have shown that they are correct. And the compiler will verify that I'm being proper here. Um, so now we'll just get into some limitations and conclusions on some of this kinds of work. Um, so in general, this works super well um, for a lot of types of code. There's some parts where I was running into some cognitive dissonance of when I was forgetting when a parameter might be erased and then you have to change your the way you're going to write the code. But you can, I mean, I can't say that you're always going to be able to write the equivalent code, but I think usually you can turn an intrinsic proof into an ex extrinsic proof uh, and then go from there. So, but there are some properties that are upheld. So uh, GADTs is one. So there's not a support for translating GADTs over from Agda to Haskell at the moment. They might add that. Uh, one of the challenges is that Agda in particular is more general. So because it has dependent types, um, you can do things in the definition of like in a data definition that you cannot do in Haskell. Um, and so it's not necessarily obvious, um, I think, in how to completely map from like the more general cases that you have in Agda to Haskell. And in general, that's maybe the largest limitation of the tool, although it's not a fault of the tool itself, is that Agda has more expressive power with dependent types. Therefore, uh, not, and not everything maps into, into Haskell. Therefore, there's not like a, like, you can't do everything in Haskell that you can in Agda. But that's just true anyway. So uh, default methods, uh, they've added some support for default methods. Um, and if you look through the source code that they have, you'll see some of them. But they mentioned that there's like something else that they want to do. I wasn't quite particularly sure on what that was. Um, there are some things that are in Haskell that are not in Agda. Uh, floats are an interesting case. So Agda has support, or at least some form support for 64-bit floats, but does not have support for 32-bit floats. So uh, if you there's no since there is no equivalent in that you would have to reconstruct 32-bit floats in Agda and then 
convert back into Haskell. So that would be a little bit arduous. Um, and then the uh, other thing is that some of the preconditions, uh, it would be interesting, they mentioned in the paper, they'd be interested to write, turn them into runtime checks. So there are cases where, say, for example, you might want to have as a condition that your uh, list is not empty. So you can do that, and then you can write a safe head. So you can do that actually in Haskell as it is, but say you are just using the normal list type. So if you're just using the normal list type, you'd want to provide a, some sort of proof um, or some sort of verification that when I try to run this function, um, I'm actually always dealing with a non-empty list. Otherwise, I'm going to do some sort of error. Um, and uh, in Agda, you'll always have to provide that proof. If you convert this into Haskell, if you provide that, if you convert, say, like a head function into Haskell um, from Agda to Haskell, you won't necessarily, it won't enforce that you've used it properly. You just have to hope that like no one, maybe you add a comment to your function that says like, hey, this was generated from Agda. So like, it's it's correct for everything that was used in Agda, but don't use it yourself. <laughs> um, Anyway, um, so overall, I would say that Agda to uh, Haskell is pretty dope. Uh, it lets us do some pretty amazing things. It allows us to convert Agda code to Haskell code uh, that's intrinsically verified and in a way that looks like the Haskell code you get out looks like something that you would have written yourself. Um, you can write intrinsically verified code and basically kind of like take out the dependently typed part um, so that you can take there are parts of Haskell that are somewhat dependently typed, but you can basically remove as much of the dependent types as possible, those that are not relevant at runtime. And then, um, so still get some of the benefits of those, but kind of remove it and actually just use it as you would normal Haskell code. And finally, we can appease the monad inspector so that they will stop hounding us and saying that our monads are improper. Um, and with that, I'm done. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Great talk as always, Ryan. Thank you so much. Let's see if um, uh, there's always a slight delay on good old Twitch. Oh yeah, the 10 second delay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, someone's doing a great job, Brian. It was great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty fun to like. Um, so I ended up setting up the, um, I want to set up with Nix. Hopefully I'll get to it by the end of the weekend because I use Nix for everything. <laughs> um, but I just set up Agda to HS in a VM so that way I didn't mess with any other installations that I had. Pretty easy to install, um, pretty cool. easy to use. So it's like, play with it. Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Great. Any questions on anyone here on Zoom or Twitch for Ryan? Yeah, I've got, you... I've got a sort of open-ended question I'm, I'm i'm curious how it extends to once you get more complex functions so you're testing very specific things like the monad laws but uh how does it scale to some horrible production code that does a bunch of stuff yeah <clears throat> um it will probably be a little bit challenging um, is my guess. So um, let's see if I can come up with an example here. But essentially, like, so one thing that I tried to do, this is a while ago, um, but um, I produced a, a library in Agda that essentially what it does is it allows you to implement linear algebra in terms of functions instead of as matrices. So because linear matrices are really just what are called linear maps, which are functions that have certain properties associated with them. So you can turn all of linear algebra into just a functional programming problem, which is always fun. Um, always like that. But one of the things is that um, when you try to do so, you end up having code that essentially like requires a whole bunch of proofs in order to like kind of do even the most basic things. So for example, one of the things that uh, there was one file I was working on where I was trying to prove some properties about matrices. I think I was just actually like, or sorry, linear maps. I think I was just trying to combine them. And so I needed kind of proofs about, um, I needed the proofs from each individual piece that I was combining that they were, the individual linear maps were proper and that the combination was proper. Uh, but I, in that specific file, I think what I ended up having was like about maybe five to 10% of the code was actually the implementation of like how you glue these things together. And the other 90 to 95% of the code was proving that I actually did it correctly. Um, so I think one of the challenges is that like you probably, uh, at least for Agda at the moment, is like you probably want to do something where you have something you really want to care about, where you really like want to ensure that it's correct. Um, and then do all the proofs about it where it's okay that like, cause you're in some senses replacing unit tests, although you're doing more proof work than I would say that you'd probably do with unit tests. Um, so you have, uh, 
So you're willing to do all that for, for work for maybe some like kernel that's incredibly verified that you have. And then you can use that uh, in your other code that maybe is unverified, some base primitive pieces that you have. Currently with Agda, it's just difficult to, um, it's, it's somewhat consider it almost like the assembly language of dependent types or proofs because there's just like so much you have to do. There's other tools as well. So there's like um, one of my friends uh, is working, though there's a few labs that are working on kind of like SMT solvers, Liquid Haskell is also an example um, and some other things where they're trying to basically have some sort of uh, engine beside or like cock has tactics where there's something that actually helps you automate the process. So Agda is adding tactics, which basically allows it to try to figure out the proofs for you uh, as, uh, as best as possible, as best it can. Um, but uh, in cases for like a lot of Agda, that's just like, there is no tactic for it or slash there's like, um, it's difficult to prove in the first place, or it just takes a lot of code to prove in the first place. So it would take a long time, I guess, to, a roundabout way to saying like, can you use it on existing code at large messy code bases? You could, but you would, I mean, are you willing to spend 10 X the development time of like there being the encoding time and then 10 X the development time of proving all the code is correct, uh, before you got back to working, um, it would be quite high in my mind. Great. Thanks Ryan, for answering that. Uh, we have a, one question on the Twitch chat. I've been trying to push for using dependently typed languages at NASA. We found two features needed, reels and floats and condu condu conduction, streams, stream functions. Can yeah. you talk a bit more about what it would take to be able to work with these features? What would it take on the Agda side and on the Agda to HS side? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and actually, <laughs> partially, it's been something that's been tough for me for a few years. So in Agda, um, there's no like, hmm, I'll be careful. I'll take what I say with like, there's caveats all over the place. Um, so essentially, representing the reels is difficult inside. Agda, um, because basically that class, if you think of it as like a type class, like it's some, some set A implements reels, um, it has to implement kind of all these quite difficult things um, to prove. And what you end up kind of coming up with is something either kind of like a, a couchy sequence or a Dedekind cut representation that are quite like, in order for any Agda to work, you need to have something where you can construct it. Um, and so making the constructive version of the reels is quite difficult. Um, so doing that is like you would do a lot of work just to there is an agda library i forget if it's called agda reels um by a professor something like that that implements the reels but even doing some simple proofs is quite difficult in that one um or it involves a lot of like high order stuff so that part's difficult floats might be easier because you could do potentially just the like binary representation and then treat floats as the fact that they are not the reels and then you could deal with that um there's the float support i've seen the agda is currently pretty primitive at the moment. I've tried to figure out how to use them and I haven't personally figured it out, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, but the, uh, so you could do floats. Generally, um, uh, if you're gonna do anything that has like real numbers in it, it's currently difficult in Agda. One thing that is to note though, is that um, maybe things will change. There is another programming language called Lean, which is out of Microsoft. So what Lean does, um, so Lean can uh, encode reels and other things like that. Um, and there's more support. There's actually this thing called MathLib, which is in Lean 3. They haven't moved over to Lean 4 yet. Um, that encodes like a whole bunch of mathematical properties, including properties about linear algebra, reals, and stuff like that. And you could use that. And then Lean can be compiled into other things as well. Um, one of the challenges there is that like, and uh, I haven't been able to, I've only found like hints of this on Hacker News. The way Lean has something called um, quotient types and some other kind of properties, but it sounds like the way that those are implemented are basically just by saying they exist. Um, and there's not necessarily a constructive way to do it. Um, and so it's not necessarily sound. There's not a guarantee that the Lean compiler is sound. I think that might be one of those cases like, um, I was actually just watching a great talk by Martin Ordesky um, from 2013, I think. Uh, but he was describing different type systems. And one of the things he was describing was uh, TypeScript. So in TypeScript, essentially like TypeScript allows you to do a lot of things. It's not necessarily, at least at the time when he was talking about it, it isn't sound. Um, it isn't a sound type system, but it covers all the cases that like one could reasonably care about. Um, so maybe that would be a way to go. But I think currently um, it'd be quite difficult. Now there is a company called Galois that works on, they work with NASA on a compiler that converts Haskell code into C code that does some of those things that you want for purposes of like testing that, um, 
it's called Copilot for testing that the function um, that you generate or for basically generating functions that test something on some real time running system are always upheld, some property is upheld. So maybe you're testing that like uh, the temperature of some sensor is always at some sort of thing. And if not, it's going to throw an error. And so it allows you to kind of write some of these things that's more easily in Haskell and then convert them into C code that it's verified, um, assuming I don't know how much they've done on verifying the compiler part. I assume quite a bit because uh, that's the bread and butter. Um, so then you could say like, I wrote this Haskell code and kind of all nice and all the properties because Haskell provides a lot of properties as well. There's like free theorems and stuff like that. So you can do stuff quite strongly in Haskell and then kind of transpose those proofs over to C. But currently I would say like, there's a bit of a way to go um, for like real numbers and stuff like that. If you really want to deal with real numbers right now, I would suggest lean. If you want to do it in the future, I would suggest, um, or in still with Agda, I would suggest either Agda Reels or there's some talk about potentially, I mean, last time I saw this, it was like, not everything was quite there yet, but you can use cubicle Agda, which is based on homotopy type theory to encode some of the properties of reals in a way that's a little bit easier to use, but I haven't played with that either. Yvonne Perez, who asked that question, uh, just has commented that uh, we are using other languages, but we're thinking of using lean. Uh, yeah. So MathLib is great. Actually, what's kind of funny is to talk about that question about like um, verifying a large thing. This isn't a existing code base, but um, there's this thing called the Liquid Tensor Project, which is by a professor, Kevin Burns, I think, in Buzzard, Kevin Buzzard um, in England. And he basically wanted to like, uh, he was given like by another mathematician was like, hey, I have this like paper on liquid tensors um, and, and I have no idea what that is, but basically it was like, hey, uh, the professor was like, I'm... I don't know if like this can be really be encoded in any of these theorem proving languages. And Kevin was like, I can do that. And so like he started that project and it took like years. <laughs> um, I mean, granted he has other things he's going on and he's helping with like undergrads and graduate students and stuff like that. But it took the project years in order to verify this mathematical property, at least this paper in full. Um, so it's definitely not like a, a small undertaking for if once you get like, if you're not on kind of some of the standard tracks of like what's already been proven, like you could easily like, be, be in a space where there's not a ton of support for that particular area of mathematics and you'd have to build a whole bunch of stuff before you could really get going and it might take a long time we have another question now what's a good video format uh, or written resource to get into agda for someone who's familiar with haskell but has no knowledge of type three and dependent types uh yeah so i would say uh there's a few books um that you can get but honestly the uh, well, it's also a book. The my favorite resource is probably Programming Language Foundations and Agda. So there, you're learning not only Agda but also like you're basically going kind of through some of the basic or fundamental programming language theory concepts through Agda. But it turns out to be a great way to learn about Agda itself as well. Um, so um, that's done by Philip Wadler, uh, and you could just find that it's like PLL, PLF plfa.github.io or .com or whatever. Um, so, and then you could read the book from there and that should give you, especially the first, it's broken into three sections. The first section should give you a good primer on how to use Agda um, from a very, like, it's very, it's very thorough and very um, descriptive and it's, it walks through everything super well. So you can get really into the details um, or really kind of understand Agda from a fundamental level. And then also you learn stuff about programming languages. Great, great. Another uh, comment uh, for reals, you have a choice to make, either an axiomatic representation or a constructive version. For floats, it's doable but painful. In Koch, there is a library called FlowCQ that has a multi-radix, multi-precision for families of fixed and floating points. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Koch definitely has like, I would say there's probably more in Koch at the moment than there is in Agda. And the, all those libraries are super useful. One thing that I have found is like, I was trying to do some things with um, with essentially reels where I was just trying to, in terms of the, the constructive means that I can build a reel, I can show the compiler, like how to build a reel. Um, otherwise axiomatic just means that I state that the reels exist and here are some properties of them. Um, and so in the axiomatic case, I found that I ended up just needing to like, have a whole ton of axioms. It made it like, it's like, okay, well, I actually can't prove this. So I now need to add like another axiom into my set in order to like sh actually keep going. Um, and it's just a little bit, it's not quite as, I would say, elegant to use. Um, and it kind of assumes that you've written down the properties correctly. I mean, once you use, like if you postulate something and you use that postulate in your Agda code, you're kind of 
it's really like that's kind of the the gun to the foot scenario where it's like, well, you got to trust yourself that you did that correctly. Otherwise, you're going to be shooting yourself in the foot um, and it's going to be painful. Um, if your property is wrong, then everything that you've proved off of that postulate is incorrect. Um, so that's a little bit of a challenge. But anyway, um, yeah, there's definitely like there are things for reels. Um, if anyone has like and like. I guess can put it up on chat or on the meetup page, like their favorite way of which to handle reels in a proof theoretic setting. I'd love to know. Yeah, I have a question. So when you uh, were talking about like monads and how you check monads properties in Agda, so first you stated that monads are applicative. Actually, it only happens like in special kind of category that should be well pointed at minimum so uh, otherwise like it's not a monad is not always applicable since agda is supposed to be like more generic and it is based on some like some logic but not on properties of the categories but haskell is that kind of category where uh, it's well pointed so for haskell we can like simply say okay haskell monads are applicative like with a grain of salt so what do you think like how come it's also applicative in agda What's like so special? What makes it like close to Haskell? Because like it, then it also means that well, it probably wouldn't be able to argue about monads in like some other uh, like non uh, for instance non Boolean topuses, which may be not well pointed. Yeah. So in this case, the only reason why that like applicative part is there is because the like converting it into Haskell. That's kind of the I don't remember actually. Is that the default now where it's like all like monads and inherit from applicative it's just to match the like um uh it's the impedance matching between agda and haskell but there's nothing in agda that really says that you have to make that true um you can like can you can define structures in agda because you can use it for general math if you'd like you could define categories that are not uh i'm not exactly familiar with this concept but anyway the pointed categories as you had mentioned and then you could have it where that isn't true or you could define those it's just you couldn't then run it through i mean Maybe you could run it through the tool. I don't know what the tool would give you. <laughs> it would just give you probably something that oh, would be like, yeah, it like you yeah, got okay. something, but it like it doesn't match the like. Mm -hmm. there, I, maybe mm -hmm. to say, um, maybe a good way to say this is like there's some implicit uh, implicit assumptions on kind of like what that barrier is, and if you yeah. don't like mm -hmm. adhere to those assumptions of what the barrier is between Agda and Haskell, you can have it generate junk for you. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Ivan Paris, who made the asked the question earlier, who works for NASA, uh, commented that he's the technical lead of Copilot, and Galois <laughs> has built a verifier for Copilot, and they have a paper coming up about it. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I saw that like because it was like it, it was in development for a while, and then it was kind of paused, and like they kind of got back to it. So that's really exciting. Yeah, that was uh, I hadn't heard of Galois, and that was the first time I had heard of their project or the heard of the company was through that project. So it's really exciting to hear that it's like keep going and it's like being used at NASA. I think one of those things is like verified computing isn't necessarily like out there a bunch yet, but I'm really excited for the, well, it's more in the blockchain space. Um, but like, I'm excited for like more people, especially like hardware engineers and NASA and stuff like that to really like kind of get into some of these verified things. But that's really great to hear. I really appreciate that comment or learning about that. You know, with the questions that Alphonse is also asking any opinions of linear types, Agda does not have linear types, right? Yeah, uh, that's correct. Although there is like some extension for like linear types to have, um, uh, I think there is some work in Agda to like add linear types and you could emulate linear types, but it's not in linear type. Uh, it's not directly in Agda at the moment. I think that would be neat. Um, there's linear Haskell, uh, which I've done a talk about, which is interesting. Hasn't exactly, that's from Tweak or Tweak at least was involved in parts of the process. Um, and then, um, there's obviously Rust is kind of like the big connect. That's not linear types, that's uniqueness types, which are different, but kind of under a similar vein. Um, one could maybe call them affine types because you can use something either zero or one time. But I think that could be really cool because then um, if there's more direct support or more support for linear types kinds of things, you could really do a lot of more proofs uh, about resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, that you've used a resource and that you've let it go, like opening a file, you've dropped the file after, and not drop the file, you've closed it, not dropped it. <laughs> That's the point. Um, so I think in the end, uh, I'll need to look. And if someone knows the link, I'd be more than happy. I would really love to know about it in terms of the linear Agda stuff, but that would be really cool because I think linear types add a new dimension uh, that two types for resource management, that's really quite interesting. Right. 
Uh, I don't have any more questions on this chat, but uh, uh, that's uh, on the on Twitch. Someone's put, uh, put uh, the sort of monad you would put in in an Agla type class would be essentially identical to a Haskell monad. It doesn't work on an arbitrary category, but on the non-dependent part of the Agla type system that looks like the Haskell type system. Right. Yeah. I mean, the point of this is that there's an like essentially the thesis of this whole like project is that there is an overlap between Agda and Haskell and like, hey, we can use Agda and then prove some properties about our code and then convert it into Haskell. Um, it's not trying to be like support everything under the sun. Um, I'm not speaking for the authors. I don't know what they're trying to support, but my understanding is they're not trying to support like the full properties of Agda get mapped into Haskell in some way. They're just trying to say that like, hey, for a lot of code, there's this overlap large majority of code and you could just write in an agda instead do the proof stuff about it and then just ship it over to Haskell. great great any more questions anyone uh someone's uh shared a, oh justin you shared the link great Thanks. yeah i just discovered this um it seems a category theory description in agda and um i think i think it relates to what you were talking about uh or the question about well-pointed uh, monads. So it seems that they that library supports different different uh, classes of monads. Yeah, it, all the theorem proving ones you like. It just depends on whether or not you want to compile it into Haskell. <laughs> but you can like you can represent and uh, like in Lean, there's a whole bunch of mathematics that's represented that has like nothing to do with programming whatsoever. Um, so you can do that. Um, it's meant as a math research tool as much as it is as a programming research tool. Great, great. Any other questions, anyone? Great debates and questions, by the way. Uh, um, it's yeah. A reflection of what a great talk you did, Ryan. Yeah, I, I'm really excited because I feel like usually, like especially with, <clears throat> yeah. um, like, because not a lot of people use Agda, it's like crickets. And so this is great. I really appreciate all the comments and questions and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. Ivan is asking, can you say a word on Agda versus Idris? Ah, yeah. Um, only a minor one. Uh, so I've tried to use Idris a little bit, but I unfortunately can't say that I'm super proficient in it or, or know it. Um, you can do things. Uh, I would say that in large parts, they're both like theorem improving languages that look like Haskell. So you can kind of use either one. The support, I would say some of the things are just a little bit easier in Agda at the moment. Uh, it, for example, Agda has this thing called Agzi. So um, basically you can just kind of like, you add type holes into a spot. I know Idris has a little bit of this, but I think it's a little bit more advanced in Agda. But maybe it's not at this point. Actually, I don't know. But anyway, there's it's there's value for like uh, showing proofs and stuff like that. At least Agda, I found to be pretty easy with that. Uh, there's more documentation. Um, there might be more libraries. I don't actually know if that's true anymore um, because you know both languages are kind of moving uh, targets. So um, I would say that they're you could I would just try them both. Um, I think the hello world and like kind of getting used to it. The big difference also is that like Agda doesn't support well recently. <laughs> There's always a caveat, right? Um, so it doesn't really support running the program. Uh, you can do that in Agda. It's like not, I haven't seen anyone do it so far, but you can do it. You can run a program. Whereas Idris is directly meant to like, you are supposed to run the program. It's supposed to be like Haskell where you write code, you write proofs about that code, but there is no conversion from Idris to something else. You can just run Idris code and like reuse an IO monad and stuff like that. Um, so that's more convenient. I would say that if you're trying to like learn things about there is that like programming language foundations and agda and stuff like that uh, i would probably choose one of the other theorem programming languages that's a little bit more mature if you're trying to get into like what theorem proving is so agda or cock or lean or one of those types of things if you're trying to go for something that you actually want to say like i want to write a blog and i want to verify that all the paths in my blog are correct you can do that in idris and it will work and there's a project about that but i don't remember who did it i think brian mckenna did it at one point but anyway so you could if you want to run the code use idris if you want to learn about like theorem proving i would probably choose something on the more mature side 